We're done. We're done. Hello, Mr. Phil Johnson. Greetings. Greetings. Good to see you guys. Yeah, good to see you too. What are you guys going to be talking about today? I have no clue. Todd never tells me ahead of time. He, <laughs> he likes to sucker punch me with hard questions and yeah. try to get me in trouble. Hey, me too. Me yeah. too. <laughs> Which is not hard to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome. He's not telling the truth. He told me exactly what to ask him. Oh, hi, Phil. <laughs> This meal is going to be about the number 10. Okay. Here, here's the first number 10. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you like my tie? Seriously. I'd give it a six. Okay, so I don't get a 10. Did I no. ever tell you who gave me this tie? No. Phyllis Diller. Oh, well, then I'd give it at least a seven and a half. <laughs> that changed everything. I'd forgotten you. She, she liked you. You were friends. I don't think that we were like besties. We right. were pen pals and, you know, families didn't vacation together. But I worked with her a number of times. How could she not love you? Okay. Bless her heart. But would go out to dinner with her and she'd be on about her fourth martini. And she was in her 80s at the time. And she would regale me with stories about what an alcoholic Frank Sinatra was. <laughs> and I'm like, here's like three sheets to the wind. And she thought he was a drunk. That was, that was life with Phyllis. Very nice lady. Sent me a tie. This is our next 10, Phil. Okay. Do you know what I have in my never before nicotine stained fingers? I show it. That's you. your top 10 list, it right? It is my okay. top 10 list. All right. I've got 10 issues, items, trends that I believe could be a threat to the local church. Okay. I'm going to list these. You tell me if, first of all, you agree it's a threat, and then to what degree? You okay. scale it one to ten, how big of a threat is this? All right? Number one, COVID. Uh, I would say the response to COVID is more of a threat than the virus itself, okay? <laughs> I, was, I wasn't talking about like the whole church dying. Right, That's okay, okay, all right. So so <laughs> I would say COVID as a threat, the virus, it's probably twice as much of a threat as the annual flu. But in the response to COVID and the fear that has been drummed up and all of the restrictions that have been put on the church and the way it has, and this is the worst part, the way it has actually divided Christians, something I didn't see coming. I never would have thought that something like COVID would cause more angry division in the church than any doctrine in the past hundred years. Wow. Uh, so I would say as a threat to the church, it's up there at least an eight and a half, maybe a nine. Yeah, I think so too. Because you, you rightly framed it, it's it's not the illness itself, it's how people are reacting to it. And right. just as opinionated as we are individually, we bring that collectively. And then the, uh, the response, do you mask, don't you mask, social distance, when do you open, worship outside, all of those things. I, 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 but I think though it's a part of, sorry for this, a demonic trend. No, I agree. The division card is just being played as, so well. As the culture gets darker, things like that become more and more divisive. I, I think if we had faced something like the COVID crisis in the mid-70s, it wouldn't have had that kind of impact on the church. But the church now conditioned as it has been for 40 years to follow the trends of culture and imitate uh, what, whatever is popular in pop culture. Uh, it, it has driven a wedge of division into the church that, honestly, I didn't see coming. No. Uh, and I don't think it's it, that everything about it is negative. I, I think if you, if you look at the response of churches, those that just shut down, some of them shut down completely, some of them just went to online services, and some of them, now here we are, as you and I record this, what, 18, 19 months into the after they started the quarantine and many churches still haven't opened up right and those who don't think that 
congregational worship is, is important enough that they would put it on hold for 19 months uh, over a, a virus that poses this level of threat, I think it's probably a good thing. Thank you. That looks great. I think yes. it's probably a good thing that some of them are closed. Beautiful. Do to pray for this? Sure. Lord, thanks for this time we have together. Thank you for this food, a token of your goodness to us. We're grateful. We pray for your blessing on the food and on our conversation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow, and a salad. Ooh, and it smells so good. Now we're eating healthy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Initially, because Grace Community Church was probably the most visible responder right. because of your size and impact. But there were other start to eat. All there, right. there were there were other churches that responded differently. And I think initially we all agreed, hey, there's got to be liberty here for different churches and different states, right. different congregations, demographics, that there's there, there's different responses. All right. So we'll just talk about in the beginning. That alone caused division because people right. inside of a church, the elders got together and they said, okay, so let's say Grace Community Church is here, but these folks decided, well, we're going to just do it a little bit differently. That's caused division. It did. That's all it has taken to cause division. How do we explain our, our, our ability to so quickly divide over how the elders are deciding to keep everybody safe? Right. What does that, that, that indicate? Right. I, I don't know because there have been more obvious threats to the health and, and spiritual health of the church uh, from on the area of doctrine, doctrines that have been under assault. As you know, over the, as long as I've known you, for 20 years, we've been dealing with um, doctrinal threats and th threats that come from uh, bad views of, you know, ministry philosophy, pragmatic churches, seeker-sensitive stuff. Stop. You're getting ahead on okay. my list. But I was just going to say, none of that stuff <laughs> has caused the sort of immediate division that came with the COVID crisis, right. which is odd and upside down because this, how you respond to the COVID crisis, especially right at the beginning when no one really knew how serious this virus might be, uh, that that seems to me that there was some there should have been some latitude in in uh, how we viewed what others did you know give liberty to larger churches smaller churches you wouldn't expect them all to respond the same our church live streamed john macarthur continued preaching from the pulpit of our church empty building yeah almost empty i was there i kept coming Shh, uh, yeah nobody knew it at the time that's right but I had a friend who uh, moved his congregation to the parking lot and preached out of the back of his pickup truck. Mm -hmm. Good for him, but I don't think it's fair if he becomes then critical of others who live streamed or responded differently. Yeah, the, 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 the sniping was so surprising because you're right. I mean, just think of all of the trends and all the fads and all of the theological assaults. Nothing like this. I think, you know, maybe a part of it is the seedbed that we've created of a lack of commitment to a local church. Right. That, that I don't love my local church. For me to leave this place, it's going to take an A-bomb. Yeah. It only took COVID. That's one surprising thing about the whole issue was the number of Christians and particularly younger Christians, I think, are more prone to this, it seems to me, than in older generations who don't have enough attachment to the church that they even missed it. You know, mm -hmm. they were like, well, we can live stream forever then. This is church. Thank you. Not realizing that in in the idea of the church, in the very name, it comes from a Greek word that speaks of called out ones, called out to congregate. This is the congregation of the Lord. And you're not a congregation if you don't congregate, right? So um, something's missing if the church doesn't gather. And there have been places, there have been times in church history where churches have suspended their worship for a week or two for quarantines. And, and in the beginning, that's what this looked like. You know, they were talking about 15 days to flatten the curve, 15 days to stop the spread. And uh, I remember our elders met on the Thursday night before the 
California quarantine officially went into effect on Friday the next day. And we discussed this and said, can we close the church? And if so, for how long? Mm -hmm. And uh, we said, look, we don't know the gravity of this yet. They were at the time showing videos of uh, right. like a mortuary in New York City that had stacked bodies like right. cordwood. And it looked scary. And there were people dying in the streets in China, supposedly. And all this doomsday predictions were coming th through. And, but we said, look, OK, we're willing to you know, self-quarantine or whatever for two or three weeks. Let's see how long this goes. It can't go much longer than, this was late March. Uh, they have to reopen things by the end of April. And when that didn't happen, people just spontaneously began to come back to Grace Church. And by word of mouth, it got around. The security guards weren't turning people away from our parking lot and people just began to come. Uh, and the church was beginning to fill up already by mid-June. Um, and it just happened spontaneously because our people know you, we need each other. We need the fellowship. We need the face-to-face -face, um, fellowship that comes with, with gathering weekly to, to worship God and, and celebrate the resurrection. And people understood that intuitively. But I think there are a lot of people who profess to be Christians who don't seem to have the sense of need for that sort of face-to-face -face fellowship. Some people say Henry VIII, we can thank him for the denominationalism and the willingness to just separate from this church and start your own church. But another commentator thought, no, no, it was more Henry Ford. Because <laughs> now I can just get into a car and drive away. You didn't have a choice, but that was your church. Yep. The end. Yep. Now we have choice. and with a lack of emphasis on church membership. Don't want to make anybody feel intimidated. With a lack of church membership emphasis, you've got people that are just willing to ping pong all over the place forever. And I think that COVID has revealed that among other things. Yeah. I'll tell you, you know, the, I would say this though, on a scale of one to 10, if you look at it just from the local pastor's standpoint, this is pushing near a 10 because he has members, mask, don't mask, distance, don't, open, don't, jab, don't. And navigating through those waters, it, it's choppy. It is. There are, there is an upside to it. Mm -hmm. um, when the COVID lockdowns began, I remember thinking this could be really bad for our church. And as it dragged on through the summer, mm -hmm. I thought this is, this is not healthy and it can't be good. And, and it, it concerned me about the long-term effects on our church. The truth is, as I look back on it now, more than a year later, uh, I think overall the benefits we accrued were actually, it was actually uh, an exciting I, time I, to be in ministry. A, but you know what pastors, I heard that from. Those guys who are more um, expository yep. in their preaching, a little more serious about the word, they didn't shrink. They grew right through COVID. We did. We added uh, something like 2,000 members <laughs> to the church in that one year. Um, That's crazy. You know, people who for a time watched online and, and then they were saying, we don't even get this at our church. Yep. And so people who never would have tried another church had no options because... Most of the other churches in our community were right. remaining closed, right. uh, fearful of any kind of government reprisals or whatever. We decided to challenge that, and it was really good for the church. Yeah. In your opinion, what, should a, a member of a church, is there anything, any aspect of COVID that you would say can legitimately cause somebody to say, based on that, not anything else, based on that decision about the COVID business, I'm out of here. Um, well, I'd be careful about it, but yes, I, I think if this far into it, in fact, I had a conversation just this morning with a woman from a different state who was telling me that, and with tears, mm. that her church isn't open yet. Mm -hmm. And that when there's any kind of gathering at all, there are strict rules that they have to keep their distance 
and stay masked. And this far into the the thing, we know better than that. We know that the science doesn't support, you know, the idea that cloth masks keep us safe. We walk into a restaurant in California. You still have to wear your mask as to you the go table. in. You go to the table. You take it off. Uh, you you sit in the airport, you know, with signs all over the seats that say social distancing, and then you get in the airplane and shoulder to shoulder. Swished. Exactly. And you're supposed to wear a mask, but when they serve the the uh, refreshments, you can take it off. Or as long as you're eating something you brought, you can take it off. I don't, I don't want to mention the name of Spirit Airlines because that wouldn't be fair based right. on my experience. But you had to take the mask down, ah. put it back up. That's so annoying because, I mean, no, even that doesn't... It. Even that doesn't really protect anyone. So, but everybody knows this. Everybody knows that so, science. Okay, so you're, what, what you're the, thinking though is, if your church at this point is an opening, perhaps it's time to consider. Yes, because that would say the leaders of your church really don't see the importance of fellowship and the weekly gathering. Um, scripture does clearly say, "Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together." Okay, but somebody would say th these are genuine, sincere pastors. Okay, they read different blog sites and different studies, and they get a different picture of the whole thing. They're not—they're not doing it malevolently no, to I, keep I people agree. away from church. How do I respond to that guy? Well, all I can tell you is what I would do. I, I, I need the fellowship. I need the face-to-face. -face. Even the Apostle Paul, who was in prison, so he couldn't attend the assembly, which is a totally different matter. But in, <laughs> in so many of his epistles, he says specifically, I long to see you face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. There was that, that desire, that craving for face-to-face -face fellowship that if you don't, sense that if that's not your attitude you're perfectly content to sit in your pajamas with a cup of coffee and and watch a live stream sermon and think that's an adequate sub substitute for church because mm -hmm. i get the i get the pleasure of that it feels good to sit there with the coffee and listen to the sermon and i could so be so you've done it i have and i can be edified <laughs> by it but what i refuse to do is see that as a substitute right. a valid substitute for the church we but, need each other but this whole thing exposes our low view of the church yes it does they people literally do church online you can't you just can't by no, definition you can't. Big, it, that's right. Built into the name church is the idea that we gather. All right. I want to move into my second concern because they're, they're kind of intertwined here. As a threat to the local church, I would see now we're, we're getting entering into a potential new level here. So it was the mandate to close down the church, mandate to mask. Now it could be a mandate to vaccinate. Which I think it will be. Yeah, which I think takes this now to a whole nother level. How big of a threat do you think, if the government mandates vaccines, that this will be to the local church? The danger to the church is the idea that we, we uh, cede to the government uh, some authority over the church to tell us uh, to, to govern the circumstances and style and timing and number of people in our worship services. Jesus said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and render to God that which is God's. And, and I think giving Caesar control over questions like, uh, you know, what you should wear when you worship the mask or you have to be vaccinated to gather, those sorts of things. To, to uh, allow Caesar to put the burden of enforcement on that, on the church, is to yield to Caesar what belongs to Christ. Christ is the head of the church, not the government. All right, let's play that out a little bit because I think these times demand we get this sorted. Because on the one hand, of course, you've got Romans 13, you've got 1 Peter 2, you've got Titus 3, 1, submit to the government. And yet, like you rightly stated, there are realms of authority. There's church, family, and state. The state, so if, if the government commands us to sin, we obey God. If the government forbids us from keeping a command, we obey God. But when we get into the issue of the, ch the state getting involved in the church, in one sense, they do. 
because I've been to Grace Community Church and I've looked above the doors and you've got exit signs and you've perhaps got capacity in the buildings. So you're submitting to church, the government in the church, but there's the spiritual component, how we worship. Right. And some people maybe would say when we worship, some of this is going to get a little fuzzy, but I think without understanding the correct where is the realm of authority? Where does it end? So this is my this is my principle, and you tell me if you think this is right. That the state, in general, can tell us what to do about physical stuff, number of parking spaces, plumbing, what have you. So they do ha they they can engage in our realm because that's a physical need. But the second it becomes spiritual or worship, sorry, we make right. biblical decisions. Is the that a good? Yes, I would say it like this. The minute it, it changes uh, what you do in worship, how you can worship, uh, or the the terms and circumstances of your I, I, worship. I'm, I'm including that. Yeah. Then then I, that's when Caesar has overstepped his bounds. Okay. Uh, so I think, you know, we are obliged to, to uh, live peaceably with as many as we can, and that includes Caesar. So we go along with <laughs> things like fire codes and all that, which are... They do impose, you know, as you said, room capacity. So that that would impose a limit on the number of people who can gather. Right. But it's not sort of a permanent limit. I mean, if you outgrow your building, you build a bigger building. And, right. and if the government tried to say, uh, no, you can't, you can't build a building to uh, to allow three thousand people to worship. You have to limit it to five hundred, no more than sure. five hundred, and that's a permanent limitation on all churches. Right. That would be that would be an overstepping of the bounds. All right. Helpful. Let's talk about masks. At Grace, y'all didn't. You can if you want to. You don't have right. to if you don't want to. Because what I just heard you say before, you're. Now the state is controlling what we do with our bodies and worship and dressing. Another church down the street goes, you know, we don't see the mass thing that way. So we're going to put these things on. Would you go to war with that church? No, but I think they're wrong if they make it a rule. This is, this is our, our position is whether you wear a mask or not is a matter of individual conscience. Uh, for the church to make a rule that you cannot wear a mask would be as wrong as making a rule that you must wear a mask if you're going to worship with mm. us. The problem with, there's several problems with the masks, but uh, if you require a mask or segregate people based on whether they're masked or unmasked, you're, you're causing a division in the church. Um, I wrote an article on this, by the way. It's, it's at my old blog, which I rarely contribute to anymore. Oh, right yeah. uh, uh, about masks. And uh, surprised at the number of places in Scripture where uh, it does talk about seeing you face to face, greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, we sing praises to God, you know, with with our open mouths, and it's uh, it, it, even all the way back in the Book of Psalms. Remarkable how many times Scripture describes, you know, the throat and the tongue and. Uh, to put a mask over your face when you're singing praises to God, to me seems like an unwarranted limitation, unless there's an absolute reason why you need to do this. Uh, the science aside, let's say that this were bubonic plague days, where people literally are falling dead <laughs> around us. Would you say, okay, we'll put it on, but would it be in obedience to Caesar, or would it be in obedience to just being smart. Um, well, you'd have to ask the question. It, it, the masks that we're wearing right now wouldn't be sufficient to stop any kind of viral disease. Right. That's the problem. It's it's show business. It's uh, it's a kind of virtue signaling that I think I think the church really ought to resist rather than than mollycoddle. But as you say, there are people who genuinely believe this is. This is necessary to show love to my neighbors and all that. I, I'm not going to get in a fight or an argument with them, but I just think the church shouldn't be making rules about that. Yeah. And if there was some demonstrable benefit to, you know, making everybody mask up, then okay. Suppose there's a, uh, a leak of sarin gas in the church. 
yeah, put gas masks on everybody. Sure. But that's not our normal mode of worship, and I, and I don't want to see it become that. All right. So, in summary, which is kind of hard with this issue, we're submitting to the government. We understand realms of authority. When the government encroaches on a spiritual or worship aspect of the church, we have biblical grounds to say, sorry, we obey the Lord in this. And the outworking, I think on some of the finer intricacies of it, we look at another church and go, you know, I don't think I would have done that, but unless of course we're mandating something that causes division. I've seen some churches, Phil, you can't come in unless you're vaccinated. Yeah. That's, that's kind of shocking to me. Yeah, it is, it is. And uh, there are other churches that have separate sections for the vaccinated oh, and unvaccinated. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it's like, uh, instead of the cry room now, if you're unmasked, you go behind the glass. Wow. You know? So, um, yeah, I mean, it seems to me that there is an obvious danger of segregating people like that according to their preferences and so on. <laughs> like oh, the book of 1 Corinthians. Exactly. <laughs> and, and it isn't as if the church never saw viruses prior to COVID. We've right. always had viruses, and some of them are more dangerous than others. This is a particularly dangerous one. And um, for some people, for some people, they shake it off in two days. No big deal. Uh, it, it's not as it, it's not like the it's not comparable to the bubonic plague. It's not, you know, killing 90 percent of the people that get it. Uh, it's a it's a virus that m more like 99 percent of the people recover from. Uh, so to make such radical divisions in the church over it. Uh, seems to me to be a gross overreaction. All right. So you're giving it about an eight and a half, our understanding of government and how we submit and yes. realms of authority. There's a lot of questions that have come up that really need to be sorted out and agreed on by us as Christians. I, I, I see that as being a potential divider for yeah. us. Um, that uh, I, I have a difference of opinion on Romans 13 than you and vice versa. And I guess it could get to the level where it's like, this is a theological thing, maybe, but I, I can't even envision that, that we would divide over our yeah, understanding it of the subject. It shouldn't divide us. You no. know, if, uh, if the church down the street, you know, more people wear masks than they do at our church, I don't care. Right. That's their preference and their business. And if we're going to say that's a matter of conscience, whether you wear it or not, then let it be that. Don't, don't, you know. Yeah. provoke division over Yeah, I, I just, I, I fear that there's been just a ton of division, though, because we just don't talk these things through or sort them out in any depth, including perhaps in many local churches. Because I, I think I just, you can kind of see the storm clouds gathering. That's a problem in culture as a whole, and not just with this oh, issue, yeah. <laughs> right. you know. We don't discuss or debate issues anymore. You, you cancel people who disagree with you. Phil, that's on my list. Okay. <laughs> Would you stop this and just stick with the subject right. matter? All right. I want to get into another one, which is actually going to lead into the cancel culture, because that's actually on my list, not just the cancel culture, but Christian cancel culture mm. and what a threat that might be. But let's tackle first to ramp up to that CRT. Hmm. One to ten. How big of a threat to the local church? That's a nine, I would think, at least. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps just ranking uh, present issues, I would, I, I would be inclined to give it a ten. Wow. It's, I, I think, the most... Um, it's, it's what's currently popular that's doing the most to divide people. CRT. Well, it's my opinion. That's not what it does. That's what it is. That is, that's right. It's its goal. It can't not. That's right. Divide. Now, in, if, you add, if you add intersections to it, black people and white people are being divided rather than encouraged to come together, figure each other out, understand, come up with solutions to problems. This thing just bangs away at division. Yeah, in fact, um, I have encountered people who are totally devoted to critical race theory and the ideas that come out of that, who, if you would say that, what you just said, that we ought to be pursuing unity rather than all these divisions, they would say, that's racist. 
that's racist. You're just wanting to overlook it. Yeah. You're wanting to smooth over yeah. and pretend that right. racism never was a problem and, and isn't today. I don't think anybody would ever say that. No, I don't think anybody believes that. I mean, it's obvious that there are racists out there, but CRT has an, a view of systemic racism that says, ultimately, and I don't know that they put it in these terms, but practically this is what it means. Everything is racist. So you look at anything, any problem or any good thing, and if you analyze it closely enough, you can find a way to say, this is racist and here's why. So everything becomes racist. And you know, I, I do not know of a born again Christian who would say, you know, if I discover something racist or a system that's that way, good. They would, have, they would never say that. But what's happening because of what CRT is, everything becomes Right, because the person racism. who's bought into CRT would say, well, you're a racist, and that's why you don't want to acknowledge that there's racism. This is your way of denying uh, the problems in your own heart, and you need to just be quiet and listen and, um, uh, yeah. you know, just a admit your racism. And, uh, again, Which I don't think there's a nothing. Christian who would say, look, is there a human being who has never had a superior thought? about themselves over others well, that is that of course that is that is one of the aspects of our fallenness we all have a tendency to be prideful and selfish and uh and all of those things and sometimes it manifests as racism it's a tendency that we all have to fight um but the problem with crt is that it, it doesn't solve anything to confess your sins it it just that stands as proof that you need to be canceled because look, you even admit that you're a racist. Well, okay, so that brings us into my next top 10 list. And that is with the CRT and the cancel culture inside of the church. And we've seen instances of that now where somebody inside of the church speaks out about a subject. And even if it's done in an attempted helpful way, if it's not deemed to be articulated correctly, you're canceled. Yeah. And that, I fear, um, is re that's going to shut the dialogue down more. And the only people that I think are going to enter the arena are the shrill ones. Like, I'm, I'll fight with you because who else would want to enter into this type of cacophony? Hey, I don't know why you're speaking in future tense. I would say that's already happened. Now. Yeah, you look at okay. Twitter and uh, the dominant voices there tend I to be. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, any social media, which I know you you steer clear of all of them, but uh, any in any social media, it tends to be the shrill voices that get the attention and and gather the followings. And okay, I'm going to add that then to my list. Social media. I don't think we should be naive in thinking that doesn't affect the local church. No, it definitely does. Uh, it, it's a real problem because I think everybody uh, who's sane anyway would acknowledge that social media has contributed a lot to the dysfunction of you know, human interaction across society. And it affects the church as well. Yeah. Uh, it affects the church in a big way, in fact. Uh, just within a church, people have networks of Facebook friends who if you say something, you know, you, you get that person mad. and. So the interpersonal problems, I think, are more common and maybe more pervasive than they've ever been. Uh, but I don't think the answer is to say, well, let's make a rule against social media. Social media. Uh, it's like any other medium. You know, when, when radio began more than 100 years ago, I used to tell this story at Moody Bible Institute because Moody was one of the first Christian organizations that said a hey, radio could be useful for mm -hmm. spreading the gospel and they bought a radio license and started a radio station that still exists in chicago and um uh there were there were lots of people in the church at the time even some evangelical leaders who said it's an evil medium mm -hmm. it's it's used for sinister purposes which was true even in its early days M much more true now mm -hmm. with some of the shock jocks and everything but uh a lot of Christians saw it as a, they saw the potential for evil in it and said, let's blow the whole thing off. Because scripture says, you know, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. 
Right. So, you know, he controls radio. Let's the, not the use The actual it. Hebrew is airwaves. Well, there you go. I was doubly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in the long run, I think you could make a, a, a convincing argument that it was good that, well, I mean, the whole ministry I'm involved in began with a radio ministry. Yeah. Uh, it was good that Christians got into radio and, and used that medium for good. Uh, I've, I've said the same thing about the internet from the beginning. I was an early adopter in the internet in the early 1990s uh, when nobody had ever heard of the internet and the World Wide Web was barely off the ground. Uh, and I said, this could be useful. I remember telling John MacArthur, I think the day is going to come when people will listen to your sermons because they download them from, mm -hmm. in those days they called it the information superhighway. Right. And the day may come before long that we're not even making cassette tapes anymore. Right. And he said, oh, don't say that. That's the backbone of our ministry, cassette tapes. He couldn't envision. The backbones change. It has, it has changed. I'm, I'm with you. You get into the arena or your voice won't be heard. That's right. But we have to recognize, all right, when these, these national debates are taking place, tended to be dominated by the loudest, shrillest, now that comes into a local church, and if my pastor doesn't sound like this, I'm not so sure I, I should stay. I think that's a challenge for the local church. I, I agree with you, and I think it's a tendency of naive people to think that uh, if their pastor isn't out on the forefront of every battle on on the internet that they read about, every right. every right. every fight between you know, evangelicals, the doctrinal issues or whatever, then he's not really being right. a good shepherd. Uh, and that's unfortunate because that's not the case. And uh, you, you need to evaluate your pastor based on whether he preaches the word or and, not. And if, I think two things. I think we all need to have a higher view of our pastor's role and his authority that he has and an understanding. Like this guy's dealing with, you look around in a congregation of 200, and when he's preaching, he sees 200 people that are struggling, problems, relational, all, all of that. So he's navigating that. If we don't understand that, we're just going to butcher the guy as fast as we can. Having said that, I don't think that pastors have done themselves a great um, favor by making their role more casual. Yeah. I, I know it's it sounds like legalism, but it's like... Pastor Johnson versus Phil is radically different. You dressing like this versus torn blue jeans. So the so our we're we have a tendency to not want authority anyway. Yes. The authority brings himself down. No wonder why people leave him in a heartbeat. Well, there's an element of that. I, I agree. And um, um, you know, given total freedom to do it any way I wanted to, I wouldn't. I wouldn't opt for the super casual, you know, service where the guy comes in in Bermuda shorts and a, yeah. But I think the real problem that underlies that is a tendency to ignore what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, we don't preach ourselves, we preach Christ crucified. There's a tendency among mm -hmm. pastors, I think this is far more dangerous than what title they use or or what clothes they wear. There's a tendency among pastors to try to make themselves uh, sort of the, uh, well, to feed off their celebrity, you know, yeah. to, to be someone that people revere and, uh, and, and treat like a rock star rather than a, a man of God. And, and that has done severe damage to the church. You, and so what you've got is a bunch of people who want to be like Stephen Furtick, you know, who, I, can we name names? Oh, just did. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm gonna pick him out because he is probably the most imitated at the moment by a lot of mm. young pastors who see what he's doing and the crowds he draws and they think, I wanna be like that. Yeah, right. But he's the very definition of someone who preaches himself and not Christ Jesus as Lord. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be the clown pr prancing around on a stage that everybody is entertained and amazed by. Well, it, it, I mean, obviously we can't read any pastor's heart, but if a pastor, and I think anybody could be tempted by this into thinking, well, if I don't 
perform a certain way or maybe look a certain way or fit a particular demographic, they might not come. I, I, I can understand feeling that, but that has just got to be resisted because it's not about you. That's you're right. You're supposed to be pointing elsewhere. Plus, even to think that way, and, and you're right, I, that's not a specific criticism of anybody because I think it's a tendency we all have to think like that. But to think like that is to lose sight of the fact that the power of God unto salvation lies in the gospel, mm -hmm. the message we preach. Yeah. It's not the style we pursue. It's not how cool we are. And in fact, some of the best preachers I know are notoriously uncool. Paul Washer isn't. Nobody's ever called him cool, right? Nope. Not once, and I've checked Google. But I've never heard him preach that I haven't been convicted, both convicted and edified. Be honest. Pick a number. It might be more than 10. How many times have you been saved listening to Paul Washer? You're right, it's more than 10. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so dangers abound for the, for the local church and the local pastor. All right, let's do, uh, <clears throat> ooh, here's one. The, I'll, I'll, I'll sanitize it the willingness of pastors to preach sermons that don't belong to them. Oh. Now, we're ranking this on uh, the How degree of threat, threat to the local okay. church. Well, that's at least a six. It's, it's a pervasive problem, and it's more embarrassing than threatening. But define pervasive. How much... How many pastors out there are buying sermons online and delivering it as their own? Or stealing sermons from online and or delivering stealing them online. online. Sure. I think it's a lot more than we imagine. Uh, I routinely take phone calls from people who say, I just discovered that my pastor was preaching verbatim yeah. one of the transcripts he downloaded right. from John MacArthur. Oh. Um, no, it happens all the time. And... Um, you know, my, my response is, hey, look, if this is the first time, you need to confront him and do it privately. And if this is the first time he's been confronted on it and he's repentant, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say, you know, his ministry is over. But I think if I found out that a pastor I was listening to just had routinely, you know, borrowed sermons and not, he's not doing the preparation, he's not delivering... Um, you know, the word as he's studied it and taken it into his own heart, then I wouldn't want him to be my pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a serious breach of integrity. Uh, you know, plagiarism will get you kicked out of any seminary I know. Yeah, but so, see, our culture doesn't even care about plagiarism. Because yeah. when, when this big, you know, broke, all right, people just weren't aware that there are literally hundreds of websites that sell other people's <laughs> intellectual property. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pervasive, it's everywhere. And for the most part, people were like, whatever. What is the big deal about a pastor lifting somebody else's stuff? Well, it's a violation of the, of the commandment that says thou shalt not steal. Okay, I paid for it. Then it's dishonest to pretend that you've studied this passage and have a message you know, from the word of the Lord for your flock because what you're doing if you bought a sermon and you're just, you're just proclaiming, you, you, what you are doing is performing. You're not preaching. Right. That's a performance. And it's the same thing as the guy who prances around on the stage preaching himself rather than Christ Jesus. He's performing. He sees this as a performance, not a ministry. Oh. And that's a, that's a disqualifying attitude, I think, for anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a serious problem. I'll tell you the other problem that I don't think most people ponder on this issue is what it doesn't do to the pastor and he maybe justifies it because he's busy and he has a lot of meetings but he's not in the word he should be the guy leading the sanctification race here and he's not getting worked on all week long by the word and his preaching I don't care what a showman he might be and able to dramatize it it's not coming from here it's kind of coming from how do I do this this is not a new problem. Um, you know, it's, uh, I suppose, as old as the church. Uh, but I know that Spurgeon dealt with it, too, because he published every, every week a, a new sermon. 
And uh, there are stories, whether they're apocryphal or true, I don't know, uh, but stories about how Spurgeon uh, slipped into the back of a church where some young yes. kid was preaching right. one of his sermons. And Actually, if okay, it could be apocryphal, but my understanding of the detail was um, he gave him a pass because it wasn't the pastor, it was maybe a deacon or a layperson who had to step in and fill the pulpit, and he gave an exception to utilizing other material to seminary students who are getting their legs and trying to figure out how to preach. Right. But having said that, he was not for using other men's work. Right, no. Um, and I think John MacArthur's the same way. I, I, think, I think his attitude is, um, you know, especially for someone who's untrained and untaught in an emergency uh, to do that, he'd rather have them do that than some slipshod, uh, sure. you know, thing that was not edifying. But the guy should get up and go, look, y'all, I don't know how to preach a sermon, but here I am. And I just took what you're going to hear are the thoughts of Dr. John MacArthur. That would be better integrity. And, no problem. And yeah, yeah. Well, not a serious problem anyway. Right. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, but, um, yeah, someone who has done that routinely, bought sermons or borrowed sermons, and he's not preparing his own, uh, I don't regard that guy as a true pastor at all. This is not a man with a shepherd's heart. It's a guy who wants to perform for people. Right. Scale of 1 to 10, how big of a problem is this? What did I say, 6? Did you give it a 6 already? Yeah. You already rated this music? Okay, can you dance to plagiarism? Sorry. No, Wrong you scale. know, my background is publishing, so I've been anathema on plagiarism of any kind right. for my entire life and as a book editor one of my tasks is to to try to make sure that nothing that was and particularly when you're editing sermons that somebody preached uh it, it's pretty common when you're preaching to quote uh or paraphrase something you read in a in a commentary and you don't want a lot of you know documentary footnotes in a sermon but if you're going to turn that into writing you have to be cautious and, and diligent to go back and document the sources of specific things that you may have borrowed. Yeah, there's, because there are people who just dismiss the whole plagiarism issue as being no big deal. One, they'll say, well, we all plagiarize. I mean, somebody had to teach you how to yeah. tie that tie, but so we all plagiarize. We don't. Plagiarism is a is a specific kind of crime. It's it's the idea of passing off the work of someone else as if it was your own. Mm -hmm. We all borrow ideas. We get ideas from other people, and and I'll, I'll sometimes see a great sermon outline and think that that is really good. Uh, personally, I try never to borrow something wholesale. I'll take it, and if I can improve it, if I can make it even better, then I'll adapt it and make it my own. Right, so there are. But you have to make uh, so it your there, own. There are some nuances to this thing because, right. all right, the pastor, hopefully, first thing, translate the text from the original language. That's a step that usually doesn't exist, but okay, that's the first step. Second step is understanding the text. What does it say? What does the text mean? What is the principle? What are the points? Then I do the outline. Then perhaps I start working on my sermon, and then I do finally do my title for the sermon. Okay, that's a, that's a lot of steps along the way. Where does utilizing other people's work fit into that timeline? It depends on what you mean by utilizing other people's work. When we all, when we're studying a difficult passage, I read as many commentaries right. as I can, and I get ideas from all of them. Yeah, and I'll write them down. Usually, write them down in my own language, and they find their way. The ideas find their way into my sermons. We all learn that way. That's not plagiarism, because I'm not taking somebody else's work and passing it off as my own. I'm absorbing his ideas and, and, and blending them into my message, but it's my message, not his. It's just my sermon, not... not and, and again, you don't want to footnote every, every idea. Well, but, but you would say, let's say that sentence, boy, that was golden. If I'm quoting an exact sentence, I'll, you I'll credit, give the source. You, well, yeah. that's just appropriate, even when you're preaching. Right. All right. Let, I, let, let me I quote this. Spurgeon a lot, but my policy is to prepare my sermon before I read Spurgeon you on the same passage, to. 
And then I read what he had to say. And if he had any great ideas that I didn't see or I didn't get in there, at that point, I'll borrow a section of his sermon and quote him. I so much so. Go ahead. So much so that people in my congregation joke about the fact that I never preach without quoting Spurgeon. I, that's what I was going to say. It's hard to not put Spurgeon yeah. into a because he did have a tendency. That he's very quotable. But, <laughs> but I say, fine, quote him. Don't steal his material right. and pretend it's yours. Right. All right. Plagiarism. It's, it's a problem, and I think it's more prevalent than most people know. And the flock should lovingly hold their pastor accountable because if nothing else, they're getting robbed from a shepherd who's not, not, way to go, Isaac. They're being robbed of a shepherd who is not becoming more godly. All right, ready for this one? Mm -hmm. This is, I don't even know what number we're on anymore, but here it is. The role of women, threat to the local church? Um, potentially, yes. I think it's going to be, uh, uh, an area of increasing debate in the years to come. Um, so if I had to number it on a scale of one to 10, I would say at the moment, it's about a six and moving up. You think it's that high? Yes, I do. Here's what? why. Because the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest evangelical denomination in America, uh, has historically taking the position that women are not to be pastors, but they have subtly, slowly, and quietly begun to change their stance on that. Well, I think the Saddleback thing is going to be a yep. tell. Yep. And um, it, we're, we're quickly moving into a realm where it's that's one of those things, uh, women's roles in anything, to, to suggest that there is this, any any kind of role or position or office that is reserved for men then women can't have it by society in general. That is uh, that is regarded as an idea that's tantamount to racism. You know, it's almost that unacceptable. And I don't think there are enough people in the evangelical community who are willing to accept the stigma of saying, no, but this is what God's word says, so we're going to stand on it. They are finding ways to try to step around that and accommodate women in preaching roles and pastoral positions. And um, that's that's a frightening thing. I think it's going to become a bigger problem because the conservative voices who maybe even five years ago, you would have expected to stand up and argue against that. Uh, many of them have already wholeheartedly embraced critical race theory and uh, intersectionality. And, and these things absorb feminist notions as well mm -hmm. and it once you've embraced crt and intersectionality i, I don't see how you're going to stand against the idea of ordaining women to the pastoral ministry well historically we've seen well let's see many of the lutherans especially the non-confessional the elca really has been going off the rails since what the 60s yeah. frankly methodists are now really close they, they they already ordain women the Episcopalians, of course, they've had a bishop who was a woman, Catherine Jefford Shoring. Is she one of your favorite preachers, by the way? No, I, you know, just just the sight of her sort of, would you, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. Would you like me to do the rest of this conversation as Catherine Jefford no, Shoring? No, please no. But I would like to do that <laughs> with Phil Johnson. <laughs> uh, no, thanks. <laughs> All right, so we've seen denominations bite the dust over this issue tends to be the camel, the camel's nose under the tent. Yes, that's right. But that's true of many of the things you're asking me about. Uh, critical race theory uh, adapts a lot of ideas that were popular with the, uh, and, and I'm saying as it's been absorbed into evangelicalism, the people who are adopting ideas from critical race theory are echoing some of the very same things that Walter Rauschenbusch and the mm -hmm. the social gospel people were saying at the beginning of the 20th century. So this is, these are not new ideas. We've been down this road before, and we know where it leads. And that's what amazes me about all of this. But it has always been true that there are cycles of uh, apostasy in the evangelical movement, and it's the same. It's the same. Well, to borrow from Spurgeon again, it's the same downgrade. Mm 
Yeah. Every new generation, every every 20 years or so, it seems like there's a there's a pro progress on the downgrade where people begin to move away from core evangelical truths into various flavors of Socinianism or liberalism, deism. These are all the same ideas. We've given them different names, mm -hmm. but Socinianism and modernism and liberalism and now even the social justice movement, these all share many ideas in common. You know, going back to you know CRT, social justice issues, you know what I think is one another thing that's really hurting us that's like, why don't we get this figured out? Definitions. What does that word even mean? What does social justice mean? You ask 10 people, you're going to get about 10 different understandings. So no wonder why we're fighting over stuff. We don't even know what the other person is thinking. I thought for a minute you were asking me what the definition of the word definition is. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have... It does, but you're right, it doesn't have a definition. No, that is... There's a lot of words like that these days with yes. this current semantic range. Right, because that's postmodernism uh, and the whole idea of deconstructing language. Uh, it doesn't matter what the author meant in a text. What matters is how you interpret sure. it. And, and that's true on every outlook of life under postmodernism. It doesn't matter what's objectively true. It, what matters is how you feel about right. it. Because nobody can, you, nobody can be certain of objective truth because you see things from your perspective and I see things by definition from a different perspective. And so even though we might agree on a lot of things, we, we come from different perspectives. And so truth is my truth. It's what I perceive. Truth to you is what you perceive. And this is the idea. So there's no such thing as objective truth, or if there is, we can't be sure of it. I, 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 should, I should have put that on postmodernism on my yeah. list. Well, postmodernism underlies all of these things. And that's why you can't define anything. A, a word means exactly what I mean when I use it yeah. and no more, you know, or when I, and now it's under postmodernism. The word means exactly what I mean when I read it. You know what I, I, just, I just heard? I think George Will stated that Brandeis University is now saying you have to have a trigger warning for what two words? Can you guess? There must be a trigger warning for these two words. I give up. Trigger warning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like asking for a definition of the word definition, isn't it? <laughs> so, so wait a minute. If you have to give a trigger warning, if you say trigger warning before you give a trigger... Or do you have to trigger warning the trigger, the trigger warning, warning trigger, trigger warning? Now, let's not get ridiculous here, Phil. I'm just trying to be logical. Well, because trigger, we all know what those are connected to. So be careful how you utilize the phrase. That's right. Well, the, you know, that sort of thinking is actually going, that that's how people get rid of words they don't like. You know what? In fact, I'm going to add this to my list because of postmodernism. And we know the old tolerance, intolerance charade. We're all about tolerance, but if you don't agree with us, we will not tolerate you because we don't tolerate intolerance. It's, it's a little shell game that gets done, but in your opinion, all right, here we are, 21st century, still sort of the beginning. That postmodern, there is no exclusive truth, and the highest crime you can commit is saying, oh, yes, there is. How much pressure do you think is currently bearing down on the local church and where do you think it's going? Well, I think, honestly, that from the beginning, the postmodern uh, thrust has been aimed directly at the church. Uh, because when you, when you begin to undermine the, the notion that there is objective truth and we can know it for certain, what you're really targeting ultimately is the source of all truth, which is God's word. Uh, and so uh, among postmodernists, it's socially acceptable to have certain values and beliefs. Uh, the one thing you can't do is is be dogmatic about any right. religion. Don't be certain. Yeah, to 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 believe that God revealed this and that's how I know it's true. That's like the ultimate crime against the postmodern moment, mm -hmm. and. Um, and so it's it's narrowing its focus onto the church. And in a very short time, it's going to be so politically incorrect to say, I believe the Bible, 
that 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 could be classified just to say that much could be classified as a hate crime. Yeah. Yeah, and it you just hope that if persecution comes Paul Washer would disagree. You just hope it would be over the preaching of the gospel. But Paul Washer, in one of those grainy videos of his, was saying that it's going to come upon the church, and it's not because of what we're preaching. It's because of what we're standing for, or they perceive it like they did with first, second, and third century Christians being cannibals, um, that they're seeing us because of our social values. We're being tagged with a label that is pejorative and therefore persecuted. That's where he sees it. Going. Well, he's at least partly right. I mean, you already see that. That um, I mean, we we broadcast grace to you in in a couple of places overseas. Yeah. Where you, you simply cannot talk about some things. Yeah, you can't say even that the Bible says it's a sin. To, homosexuality is a sin. That will, in fact, that has gotten us fined. We've had to pay fines for classifying homosexuality as a sin on the radio in England. In England? Yeah. What about Canada? Same thing. Yeah. I don't I, know if we've actually been fined there, but it's, it, it's, they're very strict Australia? on whether you can say that. I don't know about yeah, Australia. I don't know either about Australia, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, you, you look at the, the heavy hand they've taken in Australia on yeah. the COVID lockdown. Right. And it's clear that it, there's the same spirit of uh, um, the mentality is that there, there are certain elites in society who tell us what we should think and how we should live and what we should do. And they are clamoring for more and more power to be able to tell us to do that. Yeah. All right. Next subject on the list. There's actually two. There's a slight distinction, but fads and theological or, or ideological novelties. Oh yeah, they, I see what you mean. They're linked, they're of course definitely you see what linked. You mean, because that's your phrase. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think uh, my fascination with evangelical fads goes all the way back to the 1990s, probably 30, 40 years ago. Um, I began when, to- when this tie was actually pretty cool. That's right. Okay. I began to notice that uh, evangelicalism was, the movement was easily swept into whatever the next fad is. Uh, and the first time I ever said anything public about it was when they asked me to do a review of the prayer of Jabez for the Shepherds Conference. And I gave it a review, an honest review. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently that floored a lot of people because at the time, the prayer of Jabez was riding high on the bestseller lists. Yeah. And everybody thought, well, this is a biblical prayer. This is really good stuff. And, right. I, and I absolutely pilloried that. And the, the, the idea that because this is a fad, we all have to jump on the bandwagon. Um, and that was, I think, the first time they had asked me to do a plenary session at the Shepherds Conference. And after that... Kicked it off with a bang, Phil. Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> and so they asked me the next year, well, let's talk about the tendency for Christians to get swept up in fads. And so I did a message called the Fad Driven Church. Mm -hmm. And by then, Jabez was last year's fad and people were already laughing at it and there were stores full of Jabez junk. You remember you could get mugs and... Do you know what was trying to take its place? The ox goad of Shamgar. <laughs> I missed that one. It, it's buried somewhere in the Old Testament <laughs> but that got turned, somebody tried to write a book that we should all have but the, the next, ox goad of Shamgar. The next successful fad was the purpose driven life. It came out yeah. that following year. Yeah. And so I did this message called the fad driven church and um, uh, talked about the history of fads and fadism. And, and since then I've sort of watched it closely because people frequently ask me, what do you think the next fad will be? And I can't predict them. I can't see them coming, but. But wouldn't you say though that fadism chase, somebody creates something in the Christian tchotchke world and we all grab onto it. That's not the root of the problem. That's the fruit of yep. a deeper problem. I agree. What is that problem? The, the, the problem is the other thing you asked about, the, the, the idea of looking for theological novelties as if uh, the next big thing has to be something new. You See, know? I, I think it's a bibliology issue, that it's a sufficiency issue. 
Oh, we well, don't need marketing schemes and whiz bangery. Exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, as Spurgeon said it like this: In theology, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. Hmm. Uh, there's no reason for Christians to be chasing every novelty or thinking that uh, whatever is important for me is going to be something new that nobody's ever discovered. We need to be rediscovering the uh, the old truths, the truths that never change, the fundamental issues. And the church has never really been, the, or let's say the evangelical movement has never really been satisfied with just sticking with the gospel. I mean, think about it. The Gospel Coalition and Together for the Gospel, these are two large organizations that were founded in the wake of the uh, emerging church movement specifically to defend the gospel and to rally you know, more mainstream evangelicals around the gospel truths that we all agreed on. And the theme was supposed to be the gospel. And for a few years, it was. That was, that was the theme, and it was encouraging. And I thought, these are, this is a good direction. Let's go with it. And yet, a couple of years ago, both organizations basically threw that theme off and picked up the uh, social justice theme instead. Uh, and I think they would say, well, we've just blended the two, but hmm. but uh, that, I think it's inarguable that the gospel is not their singular focus anymore. Well, I, I think that the gospel and just preaching the word isn't singular anymore. And I think right. this is actually connected to Pastor Wisbang, who... It is. I, I got to do this because the Bible and Jesus ain't enough to attract Well, people. you remember one of the fads was the young restless reform thing, yeah. which was one of the better fads. It was more encouraging because at least it... It had some theological content to it, you know. It did, but my my opinion, the thirty thousand foot that I had on that was, it was it was not a fully reformed movement. No, you're right. You're right. That was the whole problem with it. What they were actually trying to do was adopt certain themes from reformed theology, but blend it with the pragmatism of the previous right. generation. So this was like Rick Warren and. John Calvin thrown into a blender, and this is what you get, you know? <laughs> That's perfect. What you get is Mark Driscoll. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> put, put those two names, and it produces Mark Driscoll. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Prayer of Jabez. Yes. I think this was my first Christian radio gig, and I was on the radio doing what you did at the Shepherd's Comforts with Jabez. Just <laughs> mockery. And I got called into the vice president's office. I think you might know who he is. Very dear brother, very dear man, so kind. Well, Todd, tell me, uh, tell me your thoughts on Jabez. And as I started to unload, I looked above his head and right behind him on the wall was a macrame prayer of Jabez that his daughters had knit for him. Oh, <laughs> so he said, why don't we go on the radio and we'll talk about it. And I said, cool, and this is, I've made many mistakes on the radio, but this is one that I really remember. Because the prayer of Jabez was about having your territory expanded so that you could influence things for the Lord. And he said, don't you want that? And I literally stammered, well, no, yeah, I, well, sort, but not, because, uh, yeah, we want to see God's territory expanded, but if I have to lose all of my territory, that's just fine. Yeah. And I didn't come up with a really clear, and it haunts me to this day. I understand that stammer. That's how I respond to you half you the time. You do not. You know what? <laughs> that's, you know what? That's the ninth commandment, Phil. You always do that. This is what just rips me about you. I'm not good extemporaneously. Yeah, sure. No, I, well, See, you did it again. All right, so fads, theological novelties, ideological novelties, the threat to the church still that's been going on since at least Jabez. Yeah, no, and far beyond before that. Yeah. Uh, I, and, and I would say it like this, this idea that uh, because a thing is popular, it should be not criticized, it should be set aside. That just goes contrary to what Jesus taught about the broad way that leads to destruction and the narrow way that leads to life, uh, we should never think that the the right way for us to follow is what everybody else is doing, what's just popular on, at the moment. The for me, that's a reason to be suspicious. It's not always a reason to write off 
the fad. I, there were elements of young wrestlers reform that I was very positive about sure. and affirming. So I wouldn't automatically write something off because it's a fad, but I would automatically give it a more careful scrutiny because I have to ask, why is this popular? Yeah. Why are so many people doing this thing right now? That I think can be the helpful way to look at this too. Okay, if something pops up, there's a reason for it. There's, there's something missing in the hearts or minds of a lot of people that this is being promoted and purchased. So if nothing else, I can take a look at the feds and go, all right, what itch is this scratching? Because it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's found something. And I, so I think that, that expositors can at least be aware of those things to make sure that they're shoring up whatever it is that yep. people are finding deficient. Yep. In, in a, in a, to try to get something helpful out of them. Yeah. By the way, is it your WWJD or WD? What is it? WW? What would you? WWJD bracelet? Is that underneath your sleeve? No. That Mine broke. One. Mine broke, and it's not a fad anymore, so they're hard to find. I think they're coming back. All right. No, I mean it. I think they are. I think that, and you know, it's something like that too. What would Jesus? That's not a terrible question to no, ask. No, it's better than what would Todd do. That's a fact. All right. Last thing on my list, Phil, and I think this could be the biggie that causes division. Two words. Ready? All right. Waffle House. That's my favorite restaurant chain. We're done. We're done. Two questions. Number one, if you enjoyed breaking bread, would you please consider sharing some of your bread so we can make more bread. Number two, what in the world are you doing in my easy bake oven?